Well, good evening, everybody. If you are listening on YouTube, um, particularly want to say to Liz, get well soon, because an evening service without you is not quite the same. So we're thinking of you, Liz. But to cheer us up, I'm so delighted that Barbara's here. Uh, just chuffed that you are here tonight, Barbara. It feels like a great evening of worship. We've got Susan on the microphone with our beautiful singing. And it feels just like a lovely evening to come and worship God. May your star pause over this place of worship, illuminating your truth and justice. Confront us anew with your call to look for power in lowly places and to bring our gifts to worship. You who are long gone from the stable, but present in every place and time, God with us. Lord God, be thou our vision. When we look up at the stars on a night such as this and see something of the vastness of space, when we realise that you made and designed all that, we see something of your greatness and awesome power. When we see the blue sky on a clear winter's day and sunshine showing everything in colour and realise you made and designed all of it, we see something of your greatness and awesome skill in creation.
when we see nature from further afield. On TV and through friends' photos. When we see the variety of animals and different places. And realise you made and designed all that. We see something of your greatness and awesome skill in design. And when we remember that you gave your son, your nearest and dearest, to die for us on the cross to take away our sin, we see something of your greatness and awesome love for us. Lord God, be thou our vision. How we praise you and worship and adore you. We confess, although your greatness and power and love can be seen all around us, so often we don't see it. So often we tend to see the bad rather than the good, the negatives rather than the positives, the problems rather than the way forward. So often we can let life get on top of us. Instead of sharing it all with you. Looking for you to lead us through it. Sorry Lord. Forgive us. Work in us. By your Holy Spirit. Speak to us through your word. Open up our hearts and minds to you, to who you are, and to how great you are, and to what you can do when we love you, when we trust you. And when we follow you. Meet with us this evening. Help us to know you are with us. Help us to know the difference that you make in our lives. Help us to worship you and learn from you. For we ask this for your glory and your praise. And hear us all as we pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. So our first reading is Psalm 15, a psalm of David. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? He whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbour no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man, who despises a vile man but honours those who fear the Lord. Who keep his oath even when it hurts. Who lends his money without usury. And does not accept a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things. Will never be shaken. The second reading is Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 to 12. And it's from the message version. You're blessed. 
When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. This is what he said. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink in the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens Give a cheer even, for though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds. And know that you are in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. We'll sing the next hymn, Take This Moment, Sign and Space.
Please God help me to speak faithfully. Help me to speak clearly. And help us all to hear something that brings us comfort. That brings us good news. That brings us closer to you. Amen. In the 1680s in Scotland, we seem to have lost our collective religious minds. In 1685, there was a dispute between the church and the monarchy. England and Scotland had both joined the Reformation. England's church was Episcopalian, with the king as its head, and Scotland's church was Presbyterian with Christ as the head of the church. And you'll know this history much better than me, but the king was forcing all people in Scotland, as well as England, to join the Episcopal Church. Many who refused signed a covenant to refuse to do so and became known as the Covenanters. In the late 1680s, A time in our history became known as the killing time, when many covenanters were executed. In Wigton, Dumfries and Galloway, Margaret MacLachlan, aged 63, and Margaret Wilson, aged 18, both refused to sign an oath. They had met in hiding to worship with the other covenanters, but they were caught. And both were sentenced to die in stakes on the Bladnoch River in front of the Wigton Church. It's a tidal river. And the plan was that the older lady was to be tied up further out with the hope that the younger lady would see what was happening and change her mind. They were taken and tied to the stakes in the waters on the 11th of May, 1685. We know what happens because of Kirk Session Minutes. The older woman was tied deeper in the river channel, forcing young Margaret to witness her death. As the waters came around the older woman, those in charge said to the younger Margaret, See, look, what do you see? And she said, I see Christ wrestling there. Then she started to sing from Psalm 25. To thee I lift my soul, O Lord. I trust in thee, my God. Let me not be ashamed, nor foes triumph over me. Then she recited Romans chapter 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, she said, For thine sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Jesus said, Blessed are the persecuted. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew 5.10, your says you're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, we heard, but count yourself blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me, said Jesus. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even. For though they don't like it, I do, says Jesus. And all heaven applauds and know that you are in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. This evening we are looking at the Beatitudes. 
In fact, this is the second of two sermons looking at the Beatitudes. Because many of you will know that we also looked at it this morning. And I just want to very briefly remind you, this morning we looked at the first four Beatitudes. And I'll very briefly remind you before we look at the final four. What I wanted to suggest this morning, that was Jesus Christ early in his ministry was also popular. They said that news about him had spread throughout all of Syria and great crowds were gathering all around him. And at that moment, Jesus chose to take himself up a mountainside and sat down. And the four disciples or so who had been called by this stage sat around him and presumably some of the crowds as well. And Jesus wanted to speak to them about blessedness or happiness. I suggested this morning that Jonathan Edwards, the great American minister, had suggested that God had created the world for two reasons. So that his glory could be seen in creation and that his glory could be seen in the happiness of the creatures that he created. In other words, our happiness, our being happy and joyful, is it the very reason of why God created the world. And so that's why I suggested this morning that even when Jesus was popular, that wasn't why he came. And he wanted to speak now about how we become happy or blessed. And I suggested that the root into this came through verse 25, 20, where it says that those who you need to be more righteous than the Sadducees and the Pharisees to enter the kingdom of heaven. I wanted to suggest through that, through Alistair Begg's teaching, that we can realise from that we can't do this ourselves. These lists of blessings that Helen read for us are not things we can just go out and try harder to do. These are things that Jesus does within us when we give our life to him. The first blessing I said this morning was blessed are those who are poor in spirit. This is the gateway into the Beatitudes. Humility or poverty of spirit is the way in. Unless we come humbly before God, unless we recognise that by our nature we're lost and helpless, Unless we come to believe that we, we can't believe that God can love us. We can't believe that God loves us, but at the same time we can't believe that God loves us so much. Until we have this humility, until we are poor in spirit, we're not able to gain these other blessings. Blessing are those who mourn, for they will be comforted is the second blessing. And I suggested this morning that the mourning comes from those who mourn over the things they've done and do wrong. And when we recognise the things that we're doing wrong, we will be comforted. When we realise we are not all that we can be. When we mourn the mistakes and the wrong that we've done, we will be comforted. It was Martin Luther, I think who said we must have a life of constant contrition. Recognising that the more Jesus changes us, the more Jesus comes into our life, the less we may sin, but the more we recognise the enormity of our sins and why Jesus came to save us. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Those who combine gentleness with courageousness, like Jesus was meek. Gentle when dealing with others, but courageous when it comes to doing what's right. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who really, really want to be right with God. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. 
Or as Helen read it, you're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you'll find yourself cared for. So let me just speak about the fifth to the eighth blessings, starting at verse 7. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. There is the ideal story to illustrate this in the Bible. And we know the story too well. A man asking to justify who is his neighbour. Trying to narrow down exactly who it is he needs to show mercy to. Jesus, of course, tells the story of the man going down to Jericho and getting mugged. First two people crossing by, walking by on the other side, the Samaritan. Who comes out the winner in the story. And the self-limited people realise the extent of God's mercy. God showed us mercy at great expense. There's a wideness in God's mercy. The story of Jesus Christ giving his life for us is the story of the greatest mercy ever. And when we are merciful we will find ourselves being cared for. The sixth beatitude, blessed are the poor in heart, for they will see God. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your heart and your mind put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. Happy are the holy. Happy are those who have a heart to praise God. How do we develop this heart? We stay in the word of God. We walk in the spirit of God. We come continually and consistently to God in prayer. And God changes us through Jesus Christ. Blessed are the peacemakers. Not the cheesemakers, the peacemakers. For they will be called children of God. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you'll discover who you really are. The peacemakers will be called the sons of God. They are those who have discovered the peace of God through Jesus Christ and seek to bring others this peace. Peacemaking is a hallmark of God's children. Last Monday, as you may know, in America, they celebrated Martin Luther King Day. And I just want to read a little bit of what Philip Yancey says about Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King had some weaknesses, but one thing he got right. Against all odds, against all instincts of self-preservation, he stayed true to the principle of peacemaking. He did not strike back. Where others called for revenge, he called for love. The civil rights marchers put their bodies on the line before sheriffs with nightsticks and fire hoses and snarling German shepherds. That, in fact, was what brought them the victory they had been seeking so long. Historians point to one event as the single moment in which the movement attained a critical mass of public support. It occurred on a bridge outside Selma, Alabama, when Sheriff Jim Clark turned his policemen loose on unarmed black demonstrators. The American public, horrified by the scene of violent injustice, at last gave assent to the passage of the Civil Rights Bill. The real goal, King used to say, was not to defeat the white person, but to awaken a sense of shame within the oppressor and challenge their false sense of superiority. The end goal was reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community, he said. 
Peacemakers will be called sons and daughters of God. Blessed also are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That, of course, is the eighth beatitude which I began with. So let me summarise what sort of person these beatitudes lead to. This is not my own summary, but a summary of those I have read and listened to speak about this passage. The blessed person recognises her own emptiness, does not rejoice in self-sufficiency, is not confident of her own ability nor assertive about accomplishments, but saddened by sin and self-sacrificing. The blessed person is gentle and pure, knows what it is to endure hardship. The blessings that Jesus speak about comes to those who have been brought to the place where they've realised that their gateway to a joy-filled life is the poverty of spirit and the continuance of that journey is the continuance of remembering this. Do we believe these promises of blessing? Do we believe that these blessings are a way to happiness? Does what Jesus says here change us? Change the way we live? Do these promises make us want to change how much we commit to Jesus? Jesus had come from heaven. Do we trust him that the spoils of the kingdom of heaven can easily counterbalance whatever struggles we encounter here? Those who mourn will be comforted. The meek will inherit the earth. The hungry will be filled. The pure will see God. Jesus can make such promises with authority for he, as Philip Yancey says, has come to establish God's kingdom that would rule forever. C.S. Lewis says that our God finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're fooling about with other things when infinite joy is offered to us. Let us pray. Lord God, I give you thanks so much that Jesus Christ, your Son, our God, did not give in to the temptations of popularity, did not stay amongst the adoration of the crowd, but walked up a hillside and told us what would make us happy. Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot know this happiness and this joy without you. Show us the way, Lord. Help us each in our own way know the best way to come closer to you. Help us, Lord, make prayer just part of our ongoing life. Help us, Lord, to understand more and more about what you say in the Bible. And help us to grow closer together as a community. To support each other. Those of us who share in the joy of Jesus Christ. Help us to build each other up. And to go out and to share this good news. Lord God, this may seem like a lot to ask. But if it's true that our desires you think are not too strong but too weak. Lead us all, God, into this path of infinite joy. Amen.
It's not often that I'll repeat the same prayers from morning, here and evening. But I'm going to repeat these prayers this evening, the same ones as this morning, simply because they are based on the works of Rabbi Burns. And we don't get a chance to do it again for another year. Let us pray. O thou power who reigns above, we know thou will us hear, when in this hall of peace and love we make our prayer sincere. Forgive us, Lord, when we have grace-proud faces, three mile prayers but half-mile graces. Let us show love at its best, helping the lost find joy and the tired find rest. We remember those in the seats around us. For Liz and those on YouTube we pray. Bless our neighbours and our friends. And bless our family too. We pray for your church here, Lord. May our actions be blessed. Add to gala new promise and take from our past the best. Look after those oppressed with grief, those oppressed with care, those we know that are sick the day. We give them to you now in prayer. Bless the shops down there, places where things are made, for those with jobs and those with name, it's for all of them we've prayed. We pray for places where there is war today, where it's hard to see your will be done, and to convince others that your love will last until the rocks melt with the sun. But we know that you love all so blindly. We know that you love each one so kindly. And when your loved ones have us parted, our pain has left you broken hearted. Help us tack your good news to the world. Help us better serve those who are poor and all that. Help take away the things that divide us. Because we're brothers and sisters for all that. And now in a moment of silence, we offer you our own hopes and fears, asking that where needed, free our weary eyes from tears. O thou power who reigns above, we know thou will us hear, when in this place of peace and love, we make our prayer sincere. Amen. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace. Amen.